looks so bare out there. Um, I'm not sure if all of our children just ran down. I saw Caleb like lightning go past me just a moment ago. I'm glad he's uh, being enthusiastic about Sunday school. Um, we're going to start teaching. I do not think that I'm going to go the whole lesson, and it's 10:10. We do that. This is coffee hour. Uh, weekend, as you know, we just had some donuts, coffee. If you didn't get any of that, go make sure you get some. Um, but I'm going to continue teaching on lifestyle Christianity. We have been um, doing our holiness, holiness series. Excuse me, just give me a second here to get to it. We have been doing our holiness series, and I'm going to try to do at least once a year, or every year and a half, where I teach about 25 weeks on the importance of holiness. Amen. Um, I am not trying to make anybody fit a specific mold, but I'm trying to promote people for Christian maturity, that we're always growing, that we're, we're pleasing God in everything that we are, are doing. And so I have already taught, I have taught four lessons on this. Uh, these, these were foundational lessons. I have taught, number one was called out, number two was strangers and pilgrims, number three was the new man. I combined lesson four and five together. Um, which was he first loved us, and it's a love relationship. And then I spent three weeks talking about Christian attitudes, and I could talk about Christian attitudes basically for the rest of this pastoral career. You know why? Because um, that's what the Bible is all about, our attitude. It's, it's how we, we come across. It's what we're thinking, our demeanor, our perception. And just a, um, another thing is I am pumped because, one, this is a side note. We have Brother Apple who has been helping out with Life Steps Life Talk, and he is prepared. After I'm done here, he's going to come up and share what God's given on his heart. But then I got Brother Wise, come on, somebody, the founder of the Bloomsburg Church. He's going to be preaching to us up there at Bloomsburg. Amen. And so I wanted to say that. I just looked at both of them, and I wanted to say um, how I appreciate my elders in, in, in my life. Amen. These, these men that are faithful to the things of God. Um, but if you have not made it to Bloomsburg at all in the month of, of July, come on up and let's let's celebrate at 3 p.m. It's going to be awesome. Um, so back to the, the lifestyle Christianity. And um, I spent three lessons with Christian attitudes, attitudes, Christian attitudes are by far the most important thing that we can work on as Pentecostals, apostolics. Uh, United Pentecostal Church International, we do place a high high value on the outward side, what we're doing and, and things that our ladies do versus God, ungodly women uh, don't do or vice versa or things our men do that the worldly men, um, you know, have no, no boundaries in and stuff like that. We believe in outward holiness. Somebody say amen. But Jesus said this cleanse first the inside. So that the outside can be cleansed. So I don't care, again, and I say this all the time, I don't care how long your hair might be. You could be Rapunzel. I don't care, men, um, w what you do on the outward to separate yourself from the world or ladies, what you do on the outward. If your inward heart and your inward man is cantankerous and contaminated by, by ungodly Christian attitudes, that will destroy you quicker than anything else. So your outside cannot cannot make clean the inside. You understand what I'm saying? The work of the Lord starts within the heart, and it's made manifest without. Okay? It doesn't go the other way. You can't have corruption in your heart and then do all this outside work and think that you're going to be, be you know, seen as virtuous in God's eyes. That's not the way this thing works. Cleanse first the inside so that the outside can be cleansed. And so we talk about we're going to talk about all of that. And, and I jumped into about a month ago, I jumped into guarding your eyes. I have three weeks, three sessions or lessons that I want to teach on guarding your eyes. I have already started talking about one of them a month ago. But then um, because of uh, different situations, I haven't been able to get back to this. And so what I'm going to do this morning is I'm going to go back. We're going to revisit lesson one Wednesday. I'm going to do lesson two and then next week. On Life Steps, Life Talk, I'm going to conclude our lessons on guarding the eyes. And so um, we're going to get right back into it. But the Bible says a lot about guarding our eyes and protecting our eyes. It says a lot about our eyes and what enters into them. The eye of the body is the gateway to your soul. 
what you see can very easily become what you are. What you see can very easily corrupt who God desires you to be. The saying goes like this, that you are what you eat. You are what you eat. If you eat trashy junk foods, you will become unhealthy. How many can say amen? I stood on the scale this morning. I'm like, oh, my goodness. It probably didn't help that I ate about two pounds of of barbecue pulled pork uh, prior to going to bed. But nonetheless, I was like, okay, it's time to rein it back in. Amen. But you are what you eat. There's another saying that this uh, for for gym heads that that you cannot undo at the gym what you did in the kitchen. Speaking of food and overeating, uh, just a moment ago, I literally busted the, the top button on my suit off. Thing took off like a 22 across the room because of all the pressure I'm putting on my suit coat. But you are what you eat. You cannot undo in the gym what you just did in the kitchen. Okay, so so again, in that perspective, the eye of the body is the gateway to your soul. What you ingest through the eye becomes a part of who you are. What you ingest through the eye becomes a part of your thought process and your thought life. As Christians, we're commanded to pursue holiness in all areas of our life. Um, 1 Peter 1.15, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversations. That word conversations, there's definition. Basically, it means your conduct. It's your way of life. In other words, it's the way you represent Christ to this world. So it's not just what comes out of your mouth. It is your life style. And so that's where we get lifestyle Christianity from this series. It's it's basically in all manner of living we are pursuing holiness because as he which hath called us is holy, so be ye holy. And so holiness is important. And so this most definitely includes entertainment, especially how it relates to our eyes. Jesus said this that the eye uh, that our eyes are the gateway of the soul, Matthew six, twenty two and twenty three, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single or clear, whole, not blinded, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, in other words, wicked or diseased or blind, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? In other words, he is saying if our eyes are constantly filled with evil sights, then our thoughts and our actions will be drastically affected in an evil way. Your eyes are the gateway to your soul. And so psychologists have verified this, that 90% of our thought life is determined by what we see. What a person sees has a tremendous bearing on how that person will think. And the natural progression, the Bible says, is this, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. 1 John 2, 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. What the eyes indulge in and enjoy is what the body will indulge in and enjoy. The progression of sinning uh, it, it goes like this. It's first being tempted. I like how David Bernard breaks this down. He said this. He said in, in his book, In Search for Holiness, Eve saw the fruit, Achan saw the Babylonian garment. David saw a woman beautiful to look upon, washing herself. Satan showed Jesus all of the kingdoms of the world. And so sight is a stimulant. It's an open door to the mind. And so he goes on to say this, temptation via sight can be broken down into four categories. It's number one, it is a way to bring suggestions to our minds about things that we had not previously considered. In other words, we can read or look at something and that can introduce into our mind a whole new different way of living or a whole new different lifestyle. And that's not always bad because, you know, I, I have there are some things that I have never done before uh, up there at Bloomsburg. I've never had to fit with Brother Coons a plastic toilet coupler into a rotted cast iron system. And so I had to get on YouTube and we had to figure this thing out. And so you can learn new things that are good, but just as you can learn things that are positive, sight can introduce you to things that are negative. 
So we must guard our sight. Number two, sights can become embedded into our memories and return later to tempt us when we're weak. I've always been open and candid with you back when I was a young man. I got I was exposed to visual stimulants for a man. I was opened to to uh, uh, por- pornography. I was I was exposed to it when I was in the eighth grade. And I remember fighting that when I was a young man. And then in my teenage years, I was doing great and 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 uh, clean. And I took a piece of rental equipment back to Best Line Equipment at the mall, and I went to the back room, and there was the the guy's toolbox, and the lid was open, and there was a full frontal of a completely nude woman. And even though I didn't sin right there, and I saw it, and I turned my head, later on in the weeks, that's the exact image that would continually try to pound my mind to get me to default again. So the things that you watch and indulge in, whether by mistake, as I was there, no intention, It was just there. Or the things you're doing on purpose can come back later to haunt your memory or haunt your mind. Number three, um, with constant exposure to certain sites and their associated ideas, we gradually become accustomed to them. We gradually accept them as normal and permissible. And so this is why pursuing holiness in entertainment is absolutely essential because we give way to certain thought processes. We give way to certain ideas and precepts. Jeremy Camp, he sung a song, and the song was this. It's a slow fade when blackness turns to gray. It's a slow fade when we are now accepting things that we would have never accepted before, but because we 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 grow accustomed to watching or accustomed to reading things, now it's just, it is what it is. It's no big deal. And then four, the devil knows that if he can get us to think about things for long enough, then he will get us to sin. Since one of the ways that the devil tempts us is by attacking our mind through the eyes we have, to have scripture. We have to go to the word of God to then begin to define how we should govern our eyes. And as I have searched the scripture, at no point in time have I read that that it is a sin to watch a 85-inch curved Samsung 8K, you know, screen. You don't see that in the word of God. You don't see anything related to cell phones or or tablets or any device that can pull up sinful stuff or even positive stuff. So as Christians in pursuit of God, we must go to the word of God to then begin to define our parameters. What is godly and what is not godly? And so David said this in Psalms 103.1, I will set no wicked thing before my eyes. This is a scriptural principle. It's not talking about the method in which you're putting evil between your before your eyes, excuse me, it's not talking about a, a, a television or an iPad or an iWatch or an iPhone or, or whatever it might be. The principle is eternal. The principle doesn't change. The methods in which you could put something evil before your eyes always changes. So for King David, who, who he had anything at his disposal, he could easily have called in for any ladies to come in, and and he could have easily taken and indulged in the physical pleasures that he wanted to. But he said, I will not set any evil thing before my eye. In our day, our temptation isn't as much as it is physical as it is the, uh, I just lost the word I was looking for, the, uh, no, the, the easily gained access. What am I looking for? What? Accessible, yes. Our accessible um, roads or doors into indulgence or seeing things with our eyes that would be wickedness comes in manners that look like this. And he also goes on to say in Psalms 119.37, he pens and he writes this, Lord, turn away or help me turn my eyes away from beholding vanity, vanity. I talked before, Jess and I, when we were traveling, my aunt had, had Netflix, and, and she would watch these shows that were called, uh, what was it called, HGTV or something like that. Nothing, nothing wrong with it. It's remodeling your houses and decorating your houses and, and things like that. But if you're not careful, just continually indulging in things that are just plain vanity, before you know it, all of a sudden you walk into your house and now you're discontent with what you have. And now you're discontent in your furniture and your house and this, and you're always trying to, to do something new to catch up with the Jones, and discontentment settles in you. 
And so he said this, oh, help me to turn my eyes away from just beholding vanity. I'm not saying it's wrong to watch a fixer-upper. What I'm saying is you better guard your spirit that you're not allowing a continual show to change contentment, godly contentment in your spirit about where God has you in life. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.22, abstain from the very appearance of evil, James 4.17. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him, it is sin. In Romans chapter 1, Paul breaks down the apostasy of the Roman people. And in verse 28 through 31, he lists 23 forms of sin. Verse 28, and even as they did not like to retain God and their knowledge, that's the problem right there. Listen, I don't just come to church and then I'm aware of God, and then when I leave church, God's nowhere to be found. God is in my knowledge and in my day and in every action and everything we do. I'm aware of God. I'm aware of what my actions are doing. I'm aware of how my actions are affecting him. When you start pushing God out of access or not giving him access to every area of your life, you're making a mistake because now you're playing with your conscience. And the more you push God out of areas of your life, the more your conscience becomes seared. And the less you can feel God and the less God can convict you and the less God can talk to your heart about sin in your life. And before you know it, you're justifying things that you know is wrong, the Bible says is wrong, but you could stand here and look at me straight in the face and you could justify your sin. So retaining God in your knowledge. So God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness. Full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without natural affection, covenant breakers, uh, without understanding, implacable, unmerciful. And watch this, verse 32. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Everybody says, well, no, no, duh. That's a no-brainer. You live in these types of lifestyles. You carry these types of attitudes about you push God out of your knowledge. No, yeah, you're not, you're not fit for the kingdom of heaven. No one righteousness will inherit the kingdom of heaven. But Paul goes on and he says this. But not only those that do the same, but those that have pleasure in them that do it. I learned something, Brother Wise, when I was a young man, a little boy, I learned something that if I was to sit there and egg Mike and Chris on to do something that I knew was wrong, and Mom and Dad found out that I was the one saying, do it, do it, do it, not only would they get their butts, butts whooped, I would get my butt whooped. Why? Because I took pleasure in the wrongdoing that they did. If you get busted in a car and everybody else is, has drugs and narcotics in their system and you don't, you're still getting in trouble because you were associated with that. Guilty by association. So in like manner, when we are sitting here taking pleasure in lifestyles that we know are wrong and sinful, we are by, by nature of association agreeing with that sin. I, I'm not going to get in it to it now. We will this coming Wednesday, but that's the whole reason. I literally took my entire collections of Friends DVDs, a TV show called Friends, and I broke them over my knee and I threw them in the trash. Because even though in my, my carnal man, I thought it was funny, some of the jokes they would say in between a, a, a married man and a woman, it would be funny. The context of the show is none of them are married. It's all an adulterous relationship. It's all about sexuality, sensuality, men living with women that aren't their uh, husbands and wives. And, all, and, and you know what? That's not pleasing in God's eyes. So as a man of God trying to please God, why am I sitting there indulging in this entertainment that's contrary to the word of God? It doesn't make sense. It corrupts your mind. It gets you thinking in ways that you shouldn't think about. And so it's not only those that are involved in it, it's those that are sitting on the sidelines chanting them on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is funny. This is good. So Paul goes on and he writes, and he lays it out there um, pretty strongly for us. But I would ask this question, how do we apply all this to our eyes and our entertainment? There are several areas of visual connection that we all have to deal with in guarding ourselves from falling into sin. One is literature, books or magazines. The, thing that, the things that we read, they are a powerful tool of communication and imagination. Reading has the ability to awaken our mind and visual stimulation. Reading in and of itself is not bad. It's a very powerful tool of learning and, and growing. How many has ever gone to school but you never had to read a book? 
Exactly. So reading in and of itself is a very powerful tool. You know how we know how to be godly? Because we had to read the epistles that were written to us. Reading is not bad. God is the one that inspired Moses to write the, the five, first five books of the law. So reading is a good thing, but as always, whatever good thing God has given people, the adversary has turned that around and offered a bad escape or a bad uh, counterfeit to it, I could say. He's always taken the good and tried to replicate it in the, the dark side, if I quote it, or an evil way. And so books and magazines have been used to capture the imagination of readers for a long, long time. But on the flip side of it, books and magazines has also been used to write and capture the imagination of the reader by using explicit language and actions that are not only ungodly, but they're sinful. Soap operas, soap opera novels based on adultery and love triangles, novels that go into detail about sex, books that are filled with anger and language and hatred and violence, magazines that are pornographic and Magazines that will show scantily dressed women. I used to love trucks, and mom and dad let me get a, a subscription as a kid to the Truckers magazine. But guess what? Soon as that magazine came in the mail, mom grabbed that and she went through it and she ripped out every picture that had a girl in a bikini next to a truck. Thanks, mom. Because she knew the danger of what could happen. Magazines are not bad. Books are not bad. But if they are influencing you and opening you up to worldly living, worldliness, worldly cultures that you know God's not pleased with and you indulge in that, I would say you're crossing a line. See, I used to be a meathead, go to the gym all the time, and I had men's fitness magazines, and, of course, mom would go through them and clean out the, the inappropriate things. But I knew this, that the more I read men's fitness magazine, the bigger my awareness to what people thought of me became. And now I'm so self-conscious about what I look like in the eyes of other people. I would walk around with a chip on my shoulder. I would walk around in pride and arrogance. And I realized that as I'm looking at these magazines and I'm looking at guys that have like six packs and they're beefed up and they're buffed and, and that's what the world is promoting as this is what you've got to be to look like a man of success, I realized it was messing with my idea in my mind. It was opening me up to a, a way of living that was not godly, and it was a continual ingestment until now I realized that when I read through Proverbs, and it says, yay, there's six things that the Lord hates. Yay, seven are an abomination, and one of them is a proud look. And I realized what I'm ingesting is affecting who I am. What I'm ingesting is becoming a part of who I am. So guess what? I stopped reading them. And it, isn't it amazing when you cut things out of your life, how clear your mind becomes? I know, I know people that are so caught up in fashion. Fashion in and of itself is not bad. Looking presentable is not bad. But if every day you're ingesting the new style, the new fads, the new trends, the new th your, your mind is not clear as it should be because all you're worried about is now your looks. There's a saying that goes like this, that parents will at times live out their dreams through their children. Well, the same is true with Christians. I'm not going to get into music right now. We'll do that whole lesson on that in a couple weeks. But there's some Christians that live out worldly lifestyles through the music you listen to, through the television series you, you watch, through the, the romance novels that you ingest into your life. And if you were to be honest, now you're questioning your relationships. Now you're questioning your identity. So you may never go out and have an affair with your spouse. 
But if you're sitting there on the couch and you're reading roman- romance novels of this happening and you're taking pleasure in it, you're, it's the same thing. I may never go out and physically have a, an affair with my wife, but Jesus said this, if I look on another woman and I lust after her, I've done committed adultery with her. You see what I'm saying? So the law was the physical actions, but Jesus took the law to another level. Jesus took the law to your mind, or or what the Bible would say, the heart, the seat of your emotions. Why? Because out of the abundance of the heart proceeds the physical. Here's a rule of thumb. You ready? If you feel comfortable reading your romance novel out loud with your children and Jesus sitting next to you, then go ahead and carry on. If you feel comfortable watching that rated R, that rated PG-13 movie in front of your kids and Jesus sitting by, and you got all the references of drugs and sexuality and sensuality and language, and, and you feel comfortable and, and Jesus has his arm around you and you guys are on, on some type of special time together and you're good with that, then carry on. But I have a, a sneaking suspicion that the first time the first curse word came across the TV, Jesus would do something like this. And he would walk out. I have a sneaking suspicion that the first the first act of violence that comes across that TV, he's gone. How do I know that? Because the word sets the parameters. Psalms uh, 11 it's either 111 or 11, basically says this, the Lord hates those that do violence. And yet we'll watch CSI and NCIS and all these things because it's covered up as, oh, it's just this, you know, intrinsic investigations and all this stuff. No nonsense. I watched a CSI at somebody's house, and in the first 30 seconds of crime scene investigation, I watched a woman come out of a, a, a locker room, men's and women's locker room. The towel was here, and it barely covered here, and you could see it all. And she's walking through this co-ed locker room, and men are looking at her, and all of a sudden in my mind, I'm there. It's playing out. It's taking my mind mind down a road of lust and taking my mind down a road of open doors to thoughts that aren't right. And next thing you know, somebody goes in the shower and cold-bloodedly kills a man that's in the shower and blood's there. And now the investigation is all built around this murder and this violence. And yet Christians will sit there and eat that up. And yet it was John the Baptist that looked at the guards and said this, do violence to no man. How do we enjoy that? How do we sit down and enjoy violence when the Lord hates them that do violence? We've got some soul searching to do. If we're going to truly please God, we need to ask, Lord, am I pleasing you with what's coming into my eye gate? I'm not going to paint everybody with a broad paintbrush. But men and women are built different. Men are sight driven. <laughs> Me and Jess were at the beach at Westerly, Rhode Island. And it's like all of a sudden Ferraris are driving down the road. I'm like, uppity up cars. She's like, oh, that's a nice car. <laughs> I'm like, women are. Or more so, I'm not saying women don't like sight. Don't get me wrong. I'm saying that's not their primary focus. Men are sight driven. Women are feeling an emotional. They, unless it's a purse, uh oh, <laughs> I don't want to look over there. Listen, for a woman, you can have a six pack all day long. You can have pecs of steel. You can be as buff as you want all day long. You can walk right out of the cupboard. Listen, I was told Jeremy and Michelle, I mean, I drove by their house, and there was a guy that looked like he came out of Abercrombie and Finch. I mean, he's got six packs. He's got pecs. He's, he's out there working. Michelle knows exactly who I'm talking about. She's like, oh, yeah. Yeah. 
But you know what? You can have that all day, but if you don't treat a woman right, she could care less. Could care less. Men are the opposite. Men are driven by sight. You know, seeing is not sinning. You understand that? I had to talk. I talked with a, a, a younger younger guy last week, and he had went through an airport. He said, "Man, I just pray, pray." I said, "I got, went to the airport, and I just laughed. I love the airport life, but the airport life is a cesspool for human spirits. All different beliefs, all different nationalities, everything, and it's also a cesspool for for the eye, because me and Jess were in, in uh, Salt Lake City, Utah." And it was just like, if you didn't have, if you had any less clothing on, you would be naked. <laughs> it was like nothing was left to the imagination. We were walking down, and one walking, I'm like, "Hello," and I, I knew exactly what he was saying. But I said, "Listen, you got to understand that you seeing is not sinning." If I see a Ferrari and I'm like, "Oh, that's a nice looking car," that is not sinning. Where the sin is is I'm seeing a Ferrari and I'm like. I wish I could have that car in my my house. I wish I had a garage to put that. And I start going beyond the initial look. Here's where balance and here's where using the scripture is our guideline. Seeing Bathsheba was not the sin. He could not help that. He peered off and here she was on the rooftop. Visible to the palace, which was her fault. He saw it. What he did with what he saw became the sin. Every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. There's a progress of sin. Seeing is not sinning. I mentioned this the last time I taught this. There's this guy that walks across the bridge. He's like the Incredible Hulk. He's a giant. I mean, he he, literally, he walks there without a shirt on. He's buff. He's big. If Jess drives by. And sees him walking, which everybody does. And she says, sees him and, and notes, man, he's got a nice, nice body. He's in shape is what I'm saying. She did nothing wrong. You understand that? But if she drives by looking like this, she goes to the other end of the bridge and turns around and comes back for another drive. The fifth time she causes a wreck at the end of the bridge because she can't stop looking. We've got a problem. You understand that, right? Her noting that a man, if she was to see Mr. Abercrombie and Finch over by Michelle's place, she she knows exactly where that's at. If she she was to see that, (laughs) that's not sinning. It's what you do with the thoughts. I was uh, a young Bible school student, and I went over to the U of M. Uh, University of Minnesota, I went to McDonald's to get the, the the dollar menu. That was back when it was actually a dollar. I got the McChicken sandwich. I turned around, and there was a college student with a, a completely see-through shirt and no wonder covering on it. It's like, there it is. I just saw that. Now, what am I going to do with what I saw? How am I going to handle what I saw? That's where we need to master the art of using God's words and God's principles and understanding to guard our minds. And here's why I'm saying all that. Nobody can argue with the fact that you cannot help what you see out there. You with me? Did you ever go to the mall? If you really want to get, get dangerous, did you ever go to Walmart? You can't help that. How, who, who's ever gone to a beach before? You can't help what that person is dressing like. Go find a place as far away as you can from everybody else and try to get secluded. You can't help what they do out there, but here's where I'm getting at. You can most definitely, most assuredly help what comes into your own home. You have a choice via the remote, via the unsubscribe from this Magazine subscription via cleaning out all the books that lead your mind down an unhealthy thought process. You control what comes into your own home. I'm sorry. Listen, there are some authors that should never come through the threshold of your door. 
Stephen King has no place in a child of God's home. Romance novels has no place in a child of God's home. Seeing is the initiation into your mind, into your thought life. And, and I, we're going to deal with phones and TVs and all that stuff, and I'm going to break down ratings uh, coming up Wednesday, and we're going to talk about this stuff. We're gonna, God, God really helped me out. There was a day me and Jess, when we were dating, and I wasn't even in church, we'd watch any movie that was there. We'd watch everything, even whenever we were in Bible school. We would watch, it didn't matter. It was what we did together. We went out and did dates and got a movie. It didn't matter what it was. We'd watch it. Anything and everything went. No ratings. The, the ratings did not matter. But then God started convicting me in the Romans class, and he showed me it's not only those which do them, but it's them that have pleasure and do them that do them. And he began to gut me like a fish and say, listen, Aaron, I want to be by your side, not just on Sunday when you're in an altar praying to be used by me. I want to be by your side every day of the week. I w- I'm, my spirit is in you. I'm with you. And it matters what you do and the things you're watching and the things you're reading and the things that you're ingesting via entertainment. It's affecting how close you become to me and when I realized that I started going through everything and making sure that I'm not hindering my walk with God I, it, it baffles me I got people that I, I, that live for God that, that pursue the things of God that have no problem watching rated R videos and I do not get that I wake up in the morning and say Lord deliver me from temptation Help me to walk with you. Help me to be pleasing to you. And then I walk to the couch and I turn on a rated R where it's violence and sexuality and nudity and all of these other things that are contrary to being spirit-led. How does that work? Something's amiss. It's either he is Lord of all or not Lord of all. It's either, it's either we're in a relationship with him and the things we're doing affects our relationship or it's, it's not. How do we go about justifying actions like that? And so God is concerned about the gate of our soul. I can honestly tell you, I don't know if I've ever read a book for my own entertainment. I just don't read books. I have looked at magazines, men's fitness and hunting magazines. And I did read a book that taught, taught me how to read the topo- topographical maps so I could zone in on where to hunt better. Uh, so I guess that would be entertainment, is learning. But even though I don't read and that's not an area of access to me, I have to make sure that I am continually guarding myself other I- in other areas. This is a fight that we will have to fight with until our flesh is redeemed. Amen. <laughs> This is something that we're going to have to make sure that we say, you know what, I have convictions in my life. Back in Bible school, you know what, when God started dealing with me, I said, I will not have anything PG-13 or above in my house. We won't consider it. Why? Because I've never watched a PG-13 movie and said, oh, I feel closer to Jesus. I haven't even watched The Passion of the Christ because it was rated R. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it. I'm thankful that it was a godly movie that was trying to, you know, expose the reality of the cross. Later on, we did watch, um, it was a movie, from. it was called Courage or, or Courageous or something like that. But they, before the movie, the Christian group that made it said, this is why we determined to rate it PG-13 because there was an altercation between a drug thug and a cop. And you could see altercation, but you couldn't see any actual impact of the altercation. It was just the idea there. And I'm like, I can respect that. I can respect that. And so we made those convictions. In 2022, we have said to ourselves, maybe we should have tightened those convictions, and we're in the process of it. Because now, even though a video is G and PG, they're infiltrating the LGBT thought process homosexuality and transgender into our cartoons. And I'm like, I ain't having none of that. 
You do what you want with you and your children, but my children and their eternity matters to me. And I'm not going to, I'm in my own home. If they're going to be introduced to that stuff, it's because they want to sit down with the word of God. I'm going to tell them, listen, this is what the Bible says about these ideas. And so we're in the process of cleaning house with stuff that at one point in time was a non-issue. So what I'm saying is this, it's ever evolving. This idea of pursuing God and holiness is ever evolving. If we find ourselves seeing things or being tempted by things and even going down the wrong path for a moment like Peter did, we've got to we've got to note that. So, you know, I, I, I don't want to go that way. Lord, forgive me. Help my mind. Help me to to fight against these ideas, fight against this thought, fight against lust. Help me constantly war to make sure that you're walking in a place of holiness. Does that make sense? Constantly fight for the place that's pleasing to God. And it's a battle. It's a struggle at times, but there are guidelines that we can apply that will help us. Amen. I am going to continue. I'm going to continue Wednesday. We're going to actually talk about uh, media as far as uh, TV ratings and all that stuff. I encourage you, if you don't come on Wednesdays, consistently start coming to church on Wednesdays. This is where we get into the meat of issues. This is where we get into the heart of things. Amen. And it will benefit you. Plus, it's, it's what the Bible says. Gather yourselves together the more. Amen. That's where you smile at me. Amen. Brother Apple texted me while I was here and uh, just said if I needed to take some extra time that he'll he'll pick up tomorrow. I thank you for that, Brother Apple. Um, it's 1050. We're going to stop. we got a 10-minute break, and uh, we're going to go over there. If you haven't gotten coffee or donuts or juice or anything, go ahead and get them. Amen. And, and um, I'm going to ask you to create a dynamic place of worship when we come back to worship the Lord. God bless you.